the Straits of Dover, no wider than the St. Lawrence, no wider than the Mississippi. On one side, the greatest machine of conquest of all time. On the other, the white ramparts of Britain. On this narrow strip of water, the eyes of the whole British Commonwealth are fixed. World history may soon be shaped here. Around this island fortress of Britain, they have built a wall of steel. Night and day, the watching eyes gaze seaward. None can say when the hour of invasion may come, but come, they believe it will. Behind the armored shore lines, 40 million people are at the battle stations. These are Britain's craftsmen, the steel puddlers, foundrymen, machinists, the men and women who in time of peace made England rich and strong. And they it is who have brought about the silent wartime revolution, which demands that nothing shall hinder the fulfillment of the nation's needs. Willingly, they have faced the sacrifices, discomfort, hard rations, long hours. For they know that the hosts across the sea are massing. Every hour is precious. Germany did not start this war. The British wanted war, even though they knew their cities would be reduced to ruins. The power of England will be annihilated. The scourge of modern weapons will be turned against her and will ravage her territories and her people. Already her southern towns are receiving the baptism of fire from our long-range guns. The role of England is to be a vassal state in our new European order. Britain and her commonwealth will be ruled by blood and iron and force. Soldiers of the knife, your hour is approaching. I can usually hear Jerry leaving the other side. We watch out for him. And as for the shells, well, we see a flash. Count 60. There she is. It was just such people as these who bore the full brunt of the first German onslaught on England, the all-out air attack of September 1940. From airfields all along the conquered coasts of Europe, Wave on wave of Goering's bombers launched their long-awaited assault on England. Their tactic to drive the RAF from British skies, to spread civilian panic, prepare the way for the invading army. So across the fields of Kent and Sussex, across the rolling downs of Hampshire and the sprawling mass of London, the Battle of Britain began. The first great decisive battle in history in which the frontline fighters were airmen and civilians. those fateful autumn days of 1940, when none knew what terror the skies might hold, there appeared from end to end of Britain the strangest fighting force the world has ever seen. An army of citizens, self-organized, self-disciplined. Their armament, hoses, stirrup pumps, sandbags, brooms and buckets. Their purpose, to save their town, their city, their community from the fate of Rotterdam and Warsaw. And even before the droning engines of the Luftwaffe heralded the first mass attacks, this people's army of Britain stood ready. Over the shores of Kent they came, over the beaches of Sussex and the flats of the Thames estuary, a hundred, a hundred and fifty, two hundred at a time, with their cargoes of bomb and fire and their fighter escorts massed around them. These 
raiders were the elite of the German Air Force, groomed for victory. Their Heinkels had thundered over Poland, the Dorniers had blasted Holland, the Stukas had shattered the army of France. Only Britain remained. Today, her seaports would lie in ruins. Tomorrow, Birmingham, Coventry, and the smoky towns of Lancashire. Within a week, London itself would be a heap of brick and rubble. to reckon with the RAF. Long will England remember the days when the Spitfires and the Hurricanes first roared in and the fortunes of war were written in white trails of vapor in the sky. As the German formation scattered before the fighters' guns, the radio reports blotted out space and time, intercepting over Norwich, brought down at Calais, engaging at Portsmouth, destroyed at Ostend, and over the radio too, the repeated warning cry of the Germans to their hard-pressed comrades, Achtung, Spitzfeuer! In two months, the wreckage of 2,400 German aircraft lay on the fields and shores of Britain. They had failed to reckon with the RAF above. They had failed to reckon with the character of the People's Army below. Well, we've pulled more cherries out of drink than all of them existed. It's a crack. Flat ones. Thin ones, small ones, you'll be surprised. We're getting proper fed up with it. Far more serious to the Nazi high command than the loss of planes and men in that first battle of Britain is the rising tide of help which ever since those perilous days has flowed in from the New World. In these bomber-laden ships, eastward bound from Canada and the USA, lies a threat not only to Hitler's campaign against the British Isles, but to his grip on Europe itself. Today, the leaders of Germany well know that unless that sea supply line can be swiftly cut, all the triumphs of their armies will have been in vain. Every ship that steams in front of our torpedo tubes will henceforth be sunk at sight. In shipyards throughout the Reich, the U-boats go down the slipways, fast, heavily armed, ocean-going submarines capable of cruising 6,000 miles in the heavy swells of the Atlantic. In special schools, young Germans learn the raiders' tactic of hit and run. Not for them to heed the warning of Unterpitz that Germany has never understood the sea. And so, far out in the gray Atlantic, the Nazis play their second card. If we cannot bomb them out, then we will starve them out. From bases along the western coasts of France, the big Pucker Wolf bombers range far and wide across the ocean, seeking out the convoys approaching British shores. A rapid inspection from low altitude and the radios begin to speak. Air reconnaissance calling U-55. Air reconnaissance calling U-55. Eastbound British convoy, located latitude 53.30, longitude 17.10. Attack with torpedoes.
off the coasts of Ireland, along the vital westerly approaches to the British Isles, the U-boats lie in waiting. Four, five, and six of them together, working in flotillas. convoy for days at a stretch, biding their time until the chance of wind and weather offers the fattest prize to their torpedoes. This is their song. We're sailing against England. and woe betide the ship attempting to run the gauntlet of the Atlantic alone. Be she allied, be she neutral, the fact that her course is set towards British shores is enough to seal her fate. that is left is a group of half-frozen, oil-smeared men, and a lifeboat lurching in the green troughs of the sea. As the Battle of the Atlantic reaches its grim climax, the world watches anxiously as London reveals the rising toll of sinkings, 400,000 tons a month. 500,000 tons a month, 600,000 tons a month. Destruction at a rate more than three times as high as British shipyards can replace. Sinkings in the South Atlantic, off West Africa and the Cape Verde Islands. Sinkings between the Azores and the Caribbean, between Greenland and Iceland. Sinkings in the waters of the Western Hemisphere, within 700 miles of Canada. Today, the shipyards of North America sound their answer in the clang of hammers. New ships to release British merchantmen for service in the Atlantic. And along Canada's coasts and rivers, the corvettes take the water to help Britain's hard-pressed destroyers keep that vital supply line open. Already the tide of battle may be turning. Already the wide Atlantic is becoming a graveyard for the raiders themselves. The final answer lies not alone in ships. Hitler himself has said, it is not arms that decide, but the men behind them. And behind these men of Churchill's Island lies a thousand years of the sea in peace and war, in calm and storm. Because of them, the convoys plow on and Britain's lifeline holds. Nazis, the writing is already on the wall. They have learnt that Britain cannot be conquered by bombs. They know that the Western world will not see her starved. Only one card remains, direct invasion. For long months, the German army staff has been planning with all the patient foresight of their kind, the landing which they know must win or lose the war. 
cruising along the Channel Coast, past Dover, Portsmouth, and battered Plymouth, Nazi planes maintained their ceaseless search for chinks in England's armor. From French and Belgian ports, torpedo boats streak across, probing for possible landing points, striving to keep tab on the movements of the fleet. And back in Germany, all winter long, the airborne army has been rehearsing its suicide role. These are the shock troops whose task it is to achieve what the ruthless tactics of the Luftwaffe failed to do. Blow up defenses, destroy communications, spread the panic born of uncertainty, and so create a bridgehead for the main invading forces. Against this strategy of terror stands the might of Britain, her ships and planes, machines and guns and men arrayed in the greatest system of defense in the history of warfare. Night and day, the Sunderland flying boats patrol far out to eastward, keeping the German coast under constant surveillance for any sign of unwanted activity. the squalls of the North Sea, the Navy keeps its sleepless watch for whatever may appear on the eastern horizon, be it the foretops of battleships or the blunt bows of motor barges. Inshore again work the mine layers, forging their chain of death up and down the coasts. Their task? To ensure that seaborne reinforcements with heavy artillery and tanks will never get through alive to seize the bridgeheads opened by the parachutists. Across the mouth of every harbor, every estuary, lie the booms, steel nets, whose catch is submarine and surface craft alike. On the beaches of England, the children play no longer. For among the sand dunes move the troops, troops in steel helmets and battle dress, and armed with Tommy guns that will cut a man in half at 200 yards. And every day the shorelines echo to the warning thunder of the coastal guns at target practice. Patrolling every moor and down are the home guard, the parachuters, whose job it is to destroy airborne troops before they can consolidate positions. Across the countryside, the church bells are ready to sound the toxin, and the fields have grown a new crop, tank traps. In the byways and the lanes, every stranger is challenged and identified. On the main roads, every civilian driver stopped for examination. At concentration points from Aberdeen to the Isle of Wight, mechanized forces stand ready to rush at the first alarm to any threatened area. Aloft, far out of sight above the clouds, fighter squadrons patrol the sky, waiting to pounce on transports and gliders before they can jettison their human loads. And behind it all, Britain's citizen army daily grows in strength as ever more men, two million, three million, four million, are called to the colors. More strength from home and more from overseas as new troops arrive from Canada and the other dominions to take their places on the ramparts. All through the broad acres of Britain they are standing too, along the white walls of the channel, on the red earth of Devon, in the marches of East Anglia. With every passing hour, this island fortress of Churchill and his people grows more formidable. Each day, the tide of help from friends across the sea flows ever stronger. And deep-rooted in these British people, in the Cockneys and the Clydesiders, in the men of Bristol and Manchester, Cardiff and Middlesbrough, in the seven million citizens of London, lies an inner strength, a stubborn calm, which bomb and fire and steel cannot pierce. So as the ships steam on up channel, 
past the lizard and the needles and the towering cliffs of Beachy Head, they sight once more the watchtowers and the bastions of Churchill's Island. They stand unconquered as they have stood down a thousand years of history, and still they throw their challenge across those 20 miles of water. Come, if you dare.